welcome everyone uh, for the Open Studio Night at Hen uh, as part of the Berlin Design Week uh, tonight. Very happy to see so many of you, also so many known faces, so greatly appreciate that. How does technology influence and innovate our design process? That's the question that we want to discuss today. And I'm very much looking forward to hear three short presentations on the topic uh, from very different perspectives and angles. And uh, I'm happy that Giovanni Betti, um, our head of sustainability, is going to moderate um, the, the panel. Um, there will be some questions and answers um, afterwards. Obviously drinks and some snacks for everyone. And also the opportunity to um, uh, take a look at the studio, uh, which is uh, next door here. Uh, and to meet our lovely colleagues who will introduce uh, what we're working on currently. Um, yeah, so Giovanni, I would, uh, without further ado, okay. just hand over to you. Thanks, Martin. My name is Giovanni Betti. I lead the sustainability department here at HEN and uh, work also closely with uh, the presenters tonight. They all come from uh, the programming team, which is really a, a team that works uh, at the beginning of the design phase, uh, trying to understand the design challenge and not necessarily finding the right solution, but finding the right question to pose to the designers. So that really trying to eviscerate what is the challenge of the project and they are a bit our internal think tank. They, they really operate outside of the standard boundary of architectural practice um, across disciplines and they try to look in the future what, what is coming and today we have three uh, exciting um, presentations on the topic of the future. Now we live in a period of transformation uh, and in a period of crisis. We have the big transformation that is taken, uh, that, that is coming from the um, advent of artificial intelligence, from technology that is accelerating at an ever increasing place, pace, uh, this exponential growth. Um, and we have also the challenge of um, environmental crisis that, that we're facing and that we as architects have a strong role to play to accelerate it or avert it. Um, so we're going to have three interesting presentations on, uh, on this topic. So um, the first speaker is Fabian. Um, and he's going to show you a little bit the ins some insights uh, in our journey in using AI as part of the design and conceptualization process. Um, and what does it mean to design with uh, team members that are not just human? Thank you, Fabio. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Fabian. I am part of the HEN Design Strategy team and I explored the topic of AI in the past weeks and how it affects our processes in the early design phase. And this talk is intended as a snapshot of what we are currently working on. I just want to share with you our first insights in an ongoing process of trying to figure out how AI is or can be useful for us. So in the past months, we witnessed like a boom of AI tools. It was, uh, we, you could say it went viral. Each week, new tools got released and um, we can just say the topic is there and we somehow have to deal with it. And for me, the boom is partly explained by the fact that um, we can suddenly manipulate other basic building blocks of information besides numbers, which is already possible since some time. The new things, the new building block, blo um, blocks are words and images. And out of these, almost any kind of information basically is created. And at Hand Design Strategy, we also mainly work with words and images, which is why we are super happy or eager to explore how these tools can help us with our processes. So what do we do? Um, as Giovanni said, we are working in the very early design phase, so before the actual building design process starts. So what we are interested in is uh, and are the needs of the users and stakeholders in a, in a project. So very early in the process, our goal is um, that uh, um, to collect all the relevant information, that um, to make sure that um, later on um, the project is going to meet all requirements. And we are doing this by opening up um, the space together with the users and by conducting workshops, as you can see in this picture, uh, workshops, interviews, or other creative formats. And we collect um, 
their needs, their goals, and also their first ideas that they m already might have. And then we take these needs and we translate them into project goals or first concepts. And the idea is that they are not already, uh, it's not about the design yet, it is rather to serve the design team that is later then starting as a guideline and to make sure from the very start that the project mean means all the expectations and requirements. And these are often complex processes, as you can see here in this picture, um, with multiple workshops up to 30. And um, I think we're the biggest, uh, like one of the biggest was in the Gastei pro project in, in Munich, with, if I um, re remember, up to 30 workshops. So our process um, roughly follows the double diamond that you can see here. And the double diamond, it is like a concept um, that is also used in other user-centered design approaches, for example, design thinking. And it means basically that what we do, we follow roughly a pattern. So we have phases of opening, uh, of exploration, where we open the field together with the users, where it's about allowing everything, all the ideas, uh, everything to be said, heard, and considered. And then we have also phases of consolidation or closing, where we take the collected information uh, and condensate or compress it, uh, all and then to translate it uh, into these precise target images or concept ideas. Yeah. Um, so we asked ourselves, how can generative AI tools help us in this process? Can these tools take over some of our work or speed it up? Or could they even create something entirely new with the collected information that we as humans or with our current process would not be able to do so easy? And our first starting point was using these tools as a kind of co um, a tool for consolidation of an, for the synthesis of the, of the collected user data. So our idea was what would happen if we gave AI a record or a transcript of an interview? What could it do with the data? With because it's it's words basically the interview. So we asked ourselves: Could it res represent or summarize these facts uh, in a form that would be like not feasible for us, or maybe in a more atmospheric or emotional way? And um, the way we do this usually is so far has been by using our car technique. So this is how we as humans summarize an interview. So what we are doing is we translate statements and information from, from interviews, from workshops, uh, into like a very abstract and but precise form. Is, and this is, is our cards. So each card has a statement and a diagram. And you could say that these cards are the essence of an interview or of a process. And the, re the result is going to be the card wall. And this usually resonates really well with the clients because they see themselves in this wall and they have kind of a visual protocol of what has been said. <coughs> so what you can see here is AI's try of summarizing an interview in a visual way. So what we did, uh, we let AI summarize an interview about AI that we made with a colleague by feeding it a transcript and then let it generate collages from the, anal from, from the analysis it made. So we asked it, hey, can you structure and cluster this interview into different groups and then visualize all any groups. And <coughs> as you can say, the result is somewhat atmospheric, but it is unfortunately not very accurate or precise. We see a little bit of time, a little bit of collective intelligence or future, but um, it's not to the point yet. So um, the interview or the content of the interview doesn't really get clear. What happens if we do not have words as a basic input, but images? Uh, and, and one image that is quite common is that we have already an existing building. So this building exists already, and we want to make a post-utilization concept for it. So we have many ideas in a workshop created or in interviews, and we ask ourselves what, can, what AI could do with them. So maybe here you could say we're, um, we would like to have some gastronomy below this globe. This should be somehow like a, a lively space, some, a culture space. It should be more green maybe. So here are the results. <laughs> um, first of all, maybe what you see, it was not possible for us to create one image that shows all ideas, which a, a good concept usually should do. It should be multifaceted. It should be, uh, it should have multiple things. But um, what you can see here is like on the left, you see some kind of culture space. On the right, it's a bit more like artsy or like it's like a restaurant setting. And in the middle, we have this green globe. And um, 
if you have an even closer look, you see that in the process we also lost our building. <laughs> so it is not even the same room anymore. And um, you see, okay, we have like this globe, but it's always in a different position. And this, this yellow element, which was present in the first picture, is also there, but it's, uh, it moved and it represents different things. And so to remain or to retain the room and show all our ideas, um, so far we only have Photoshop. <laughs> <coughs> so what can we summarize uh, or what can we see from these examples? The synthesis or consolidation of information using generative AI tools that are needed for words and images, they only work to a limited extent. And this is partly due to the way these tools work because they do not understand what is seen, but they perform their tasks or whatever we tell it based on learned patterns from training data. And this is really important to consider or to understand, um, to understand the outputs that are possible. Um, you, have to, um, you have to imagine these tools are like, their diet are like billions of pictures from the internet or from, from Google uh, or, or words also. And from these um, patterns, um, or from these data patterns are concluded. And this is what, to, what appears to be intelligent, but it is limited uh, in certain ways. Uh, firstly, it's like, it's not precise because not the whole context is considered, the whole context of the building or setting, but only a small scope or fragment of the information. And also the ability to abstract is limited. So for example, if, you s if we talk or see like a light bulb, we get a light bulb and we do not get an idea, for example, which is what we, what we have in mind when, for example, we draw a light bulb. It could also be a metaphor for something else. And so it takes the things very literally and it also does not understand nuances. So what does this mean now? Is, uh, is it useless for us? No, we wouldn't say so because we still have the explanatory phase, uh, the exploratory phase. So here we do not necessarily need the precision and abstraction, but instead is the goal is to generate new ideas and concepts and to have a base for discussion and um, that could still later on be refined in the process. And here we can literally um, understand AI as a kind of creative genius who knows all the styles and, uh, and text styles of the world. And we only need to give it the necessary guardrails so it creates something that we would like to have. And in the following, uh, I have some examples for you where we um, more successfully used AI in our exploration phase. Uh, so the first one is the exploration of data. So for a huge museum project, um, we had like a big, quite a big room table with more than 1,000 rooms. And you can imagine maybe this feeling to sit in front of this Excel file and try to, to navigate it. So we asked our tool for interpretation possibilities uh, of the data to see if and how we could make it a bit more understandable for us. And it's important to note here that we didn't input direct generation, we didn't say, give me a diagram, we just asked for, um, for ideas of interpretation, for exploration. So I volunteered <laughs> to be AI's intern and I executed everything it suggested. And so it wanted me to install some Python libraries. And then after some iterations, um, I coded kind of these diagrams, like with basically AI coded it and I just executed the code. Um, and so what we got is like some kind of interactive um, diagram that you can click and um, that shows the rooms clustered of this museum in, in functional areas and by clicking on any of them you can see it opens and you see all the attached rooms and of course this was, uh, is quite helpful to get like a feeling for the data. Another example that we um, use quite often uh, is a, uh, an exploration of atmospheres. Um, so to visualize or show first concept ideas uh, we often use these type of sketches that you can see um, to quickly create an atmosphere. And they are more about the use of the space. It's, um, it's remember, we are not yet in the design phase, so it's more about the, the qualities that, these kind of sp that the space should have. So, um, and so we ask ourselves, what happens when we provide AI with a sketch that we know is already liked by our clients? We, li we know they like the style. And we ask ourselves, can, they, can AI maybe create something new from that? So we gave it some examples. The first one um, is a sketch for, um, is this sketch transformed into some kind of fitting lounge or uh, design space for Porsche. Uh, and you can also know, maybe you see the color difference. <laughs> this is uh, one of the patterns in the training data. Maybe 
there are more red Porsches than green ones, so the color changed, but other than that, we could, we could retain quite a lot of the original sketch. And the other example is based on the same sketch, and here the idea was to say, we need to create an office concept for Duxer, it's a big logistics company, and this office concept should represent the core of the company, which is which is logistics, so it's like it has this kind of industrial shift to it. And we also found this quite successful because it, um, it matched the colors and it also integrated some, some elements. So, and then this would be a good base for discussion with the client, maybe with some refinement. <coughs> and the third one is an exploration of experiences. Um, that's another, another medium that we use quite often, our user journeys. And um, the, the purpose of the, them is to show or explain an experience through a building. So here are also details like the rooms, they don't, ha they don't have to be super accurate because it's more about the person uh, and also they are like emotional experience. And here uh, these tools also are of great help because they master also very specific styles like here, like this kind of colorful urban vibe that maybe resonates with a certain type of project. And I am personally not able to to illustrate on this level, so it's <laughs> it's super good like to have these tools at hand. But uh, a little side note: of course, it's again not possible to just type in "I want to I want to have a user journey" because this is again abstraction. So we have to create every image, uh, then uh, like each individually, and then put it back together uh, and create the story ourselves. So what's next for us? Um, we, we are talking about a disruptive and fast-paced technology and it, there's a lot of high public interest and also like big investments are made. So there are constantly new tools and the tools also develop super quick. So this is only a snapshot right now and for sure it will also change a lot. So, but what we can already say is that we see a lot of potential or we see potential for the explorative phase, especially uh, to speed up processes that we are already doing also the creative ones that, um, that I showed. And this also um, helps to increase the number of variants or also possibilities that we use to visualize or explain a certain kind of information because now we need less time before to make a sketch. Um, maybe we needed one or two days and now we can create the same kind of sketch in, in less time which opens up possibilities for us to also then explore different ways. And the last thing is um, that we also just began to tap the potential. And there's like a plethora of tools. There's now, I read there's like also tools for Rhino where you can go from messing model to render or you can have generative floor plan tools. So only by trying, uh, in the end it's, uh, we think it's a lot of learning by doing. So only by trying these tools out, we know um, how they can work and uh, maybe with the end goal to discover a more hybrid workflow so that we can use these tools for what they're good at for grading, but also not um, so we have more time for the things that, that we, we, we know better right now, like for example, this abstractive part. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fabian, for this interesting exploration of how uh, computer tools change the way we work. Um, now, staying on the topic of computational tools and how they change uh, our approach to design, Marcus <laughs> will show us what, what does it mean uh, to be an architect in the age of the, when the metaverse is born. Um, so now there we, we start more and more exploring digital spaces. We have been for a long time designing our buildings digital first or digital as well. Um, and now there is this, this possibility to um, really explore this digital realm and to leave it uh, to a way that hasn't been uh, accessible, in a way that hasn't been accessible before. So um, I welcome Marcos Jacobi is uh, the head of the design strategy or programming team here at hand. And thank you. Take us uh, in the metaverse. I'll try. Thank <laughs> you. Bye -bye.
I actually wanted to say something before we started the, the, the presentation overall. Whatever we show you guys today is actually um, just a snapshot of some exploration of those tools. So don't take everything too serious. It's not some kind of final message or um, recommendation or anything we, wanna, we want to transmit. It's kind of a, a, a peek over our shoulders to see what, what we are doing. A lot of the things might not lead to anything, but we thought that it's interesting regardless and that we should share some of the experiences we, we have. Um, and with that in mind, this is also a presentation that you should read like that because there can be a lot of criticism to it and not everything we show is the way we would do things in the future, similar to what um, Fabian um, showed before. So keep that in mind while you watch that and then we take it from there. So when, when you guys think about the metaverse or we talk about the metaverse, I think a lot of people think of these types of elements, right? Gaming environments, um, cryptocurrencies, bitcoins, um, avatars, board monkeys, you know, whatever you want to talk, talk about it. So even though that stuff is really interesting, this is not m what we are focused on currently. So we are actually interested in trying to figure out what the potential um, for uh, work environments are. Hybrid work, we are asked quite a bit what the future of hy hybrid work is. Um, how do we collaborate in the future with all those new tools available? So yes, it's the same technology. It has a lot of like interactions between gaming and crypto and Web3, but we are, we are trying to focus mostly on the hybrid work component of it. So the questions we need to ask is what, what we as architects, you know, as architects in the physical world, what do we trying to, what, 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 what is our role if we think about the metaverse? Because if we build in the physical space, we try to create spatial experiences, you know, spatial experiences that are based on distinctions and, and, and um, learned activities. We try to create spaces that um, uh, uh, foster a certain behavior of people in them. You don't walk into a library and, you know, normally you would start playing music loud because it's an intrinsic um, coding of the architecture, right, that, that, that uh, fosters certain behavior. We, we um, uh, try to create spaces that foster communications. Um, we try to create spaces that uh, foster interactions, that people meet each other, um, that people run into each other, that people exchange ideas. And this component of communications is so important to us because our work process processes become so complex, right? The, the, the just very few of you probably start one process, work process, and you will be able just by yourself to finish it. Normally you would need a lot of different people to help you out, to interact with. Um, and that interact or communication is so important because it helps you ease the complexity of those processes and make them manageable somehow. And um, that, that is what we, where, where we as an office um, have the philosophy of what architecture needs to fulfill or needs to fulfill very often and particularly because we build a lot of workplace environments, offices or production facilities, uh, laboratories, etc. Um, the question, like normally in the physical space, we do that by, you know, distinguishing um, um, elements from each other. You know, you have spaces for concentrated work or in communication. You have private spaces and public spaces, indoor and outdoor. Without the other, the first one doesn't exist, right? Um, so the whole definition of architectural coding is by distinction. And those distinctions are worth nothing in the virtual world, right? There's no indoor, outdoor. It th you don't get wet if you stand outdoor, right? It's not getting cold, so all these elements somehow don't exist in the, physical, in the digital world. And the question is a little bit what comes in their place? What is it that we as architects need to focus on if we, if we start to design spatial experiences, experiences in the virtual world? And I don't really have any answers, but this is how we set out to explore those. Um, and uh, I think it's a little bit of a longer uh, uh, journey we have in front of us, and I take you a little bit how we started that and where we got with it. So we started with putting, up, putting out some hypothesis or some thesis and say, okay, we assume that most meetings, formal and informal, will happen virtually at some point in the future, right? Right or wrong, it doesn't really matter, it's a, it's a, a hypothesis. Um, office spaces will be redesigned to support virtual collaboration, the role of the architect here is mostly to redesign physical spaces that allow for virtual um, uh, collaboration. Another one could be most companies will also have virtual offices. That might be true, maybe not, but what, that does, what does it imply for, for uh, virtual spaces and their experience to create? 
uh, virtual HQs will be accessible to the public. I think this is a very interesting point because it has something to do with urban planning and you know, a lot of urban planners uh, have the idea of that ground floor spaces for offices need to be generally public because it's a contribution to the public space and to the uh, city realm. Um, companies will buy and sell digital products. This is interesting because you get out of the role of a designer or a facilitator, you become, because this is about uh, transaction, you know. B uh, the web, we know, it doesn't allow for transactions. So there's no recording of a digital transaction before blockchain technology, technically. So this is interesting because it will change the way we think what can be done in offices, not just as a virtual space to talk to each other. Um, and then last but not least, and probably one of the most interesting things to us right now is the physical and virtual wor world could be merged or will merge. So we might be able to put one thing on top of the other. Um, and just to summarize, is those three, virtual HQ, accessible to the public, kind of the hybrid between virtual and physical, and the kind of transactional component are the elements we are, we are interested in exploring because it combines our role as a designer and our role as a, a facilitator of tr interactions and communication, as I explained a little bit earlier. Um, so where did we start? You know, we do, we do design buildings. Um, this is the Zalando, the latest Zalando building, which is currently kind of looks like the construction site image here. So it's almost done in uh, the structural, com I think the facade is also on too. So we have renderings, we have a construction site, we, we now have digital twins, so we have a whole, you know, pretty detailed uh, model of the building. So we thought of starting with that and, you know, because you didn't close your eyes when I set up, you know already what I'm going to show you now. Anyway, I wanted to show you the building uh, in the metaverse, which we walked around a little bit. And um, it's interesting because that's really easy to, this is really quick to, to do. Um, I mean, this is a little exaggeration. It's not that quick because it requires a lot of different modeling to make a model work like that. But um, basically, we took the digital twin and uh, just tried to replicate what we, uh, what we did uh, what we already had. And the interesting part here is not so much how it looks because you guys know all, you all know renderings and you know, um, that look much better than this. But the interesting component is that this, this model already, if you go up there, if I can walk here, it, this model also um, already includes collaboration tools. So if we go, for example, to the third floor, um, that was a little fast because obviously the concept of an elevator in the metaverse is uh, a different one, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, you know, you can basically um, allow your clients to walk through buildings, you know, years before they open. You can uh, try out different furniture pieces in meeting rooms. You can, you know, try different modes of collaboration. You can open it to people. Um, um, why are you standing up? Sit down. Oh, see? It's all not so easy. <laughs> well, if you really want to stand, then just stand. <laughs> so, um, you know, you can, you can, oh. great. I have to turn around, I guess. Because I want to show you something else. Um, you can, uh, if Natasha would be here too, which she <laughs> currently isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk to her a little bit. Um, so you can use these meeting rooms actually for the things. You could test them, you know, if you get a little bit used to it. Um, you could do events, you could do um, kind of change management and transformation technology uh, uh, events in buildings long before people can actually use them. And we have another uh, uh, very distinctive uh, interest in it because we, we do another uh, research project that's called uh, shaping space, communication patterns. So you see here on the roofs, like lo lo this little um, white round disc on the beams is a locator. Uh, we did tests where we were wearing these um, uh, little beacons and they would track your positions and um, we would try to recognize informal communication patterns in our office. So, you know, people can recognize communication patterns in meeting rooms, but it's really hard to figure out how informal communication works in an office. 
how do people interact when they wait for their coffee or if they you know walk on the on the uh, hallways etc so this is a project where we try to visualize that uh, uh, we, we basically compared the, the, the accuracy data with video footage and then we created this you know visualizations of communication patterns I don't really want to go into it um, because I'm overdrawing my time already but the, the point is that we see a huge uh, potential by combining uh, physical elements and digital ones on top of each other because we would know if people sit in that meeting room in the back and if you would have a digital twin of this office then you could basically have those three people who sit in the meeting room in the back being avatars in the re in the virtual office um, so if someone logs in from home and explores a digital twin or virtual office in the metaverse he would see that some people sit in this meeting room, um, even though they're not in the virtual world, they're physically sitting in the office, but through technology you could somehow facilitate something like informal communication, run into each other without calling someone on Teams. I mean, there is literally not nothing like informal and, and, and ser 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 serendipity or, or accidental communication in our current digital tools we have, right? Because you not accidentally call someone, you know? It's the o most awkward thing, you know. So we have, we see some kind of potential here in overlaying the two, and that's why we started with replicating a digital twin, even though it's kind of boring, um, because uh, you would ask why, why do you replicate like the exact version of a physical building um, when you don't have anything like gravity and weather and you know all the things that are so tedious to us by planning buildings and. That's the last thing I want to take you to. You know, this is the, 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 the foyer for the Zalando uh, building that's already built and open. Um, and we didn't get to explore this yet, so I'm showing you a mixture between like sketches we did and some AI uh, images Fabian did for that purpose. Um, you know, you start kind of you, you you start with the space that exists because in a lot of company in for companies it's really important to have corporate CI to have recognition that people know if they come even in a virtual building that it has something to do they have elements to latch on they know already right they're not lost in some gamey world that has nothing to do with what they know particularly if it's about um, um, hybrid work and collaboration so you know you remove um, the roof you don't have columns you start exploring buildings in totally different ways so now now this the fun starts from a designing perspective because you need to kind of find a thin line between um, creating something that people recognize and use as a foyer or an entrance to a world that has literally no um, um, constraints anymore right um, and uh, this is a little bit of an exploration where we trying probably the next phase will be to try to, to, to explore the freedom you have in the virtual world and at the same time try something that is valuable in a sense that people would use that for hybrid, uh, hybrid work and virtual collaboration. And um, I don't know if, if uh, headquarters will look like that in the future, but I'm pretty sure that there will be a component that needs to remind them um, on their actual headquarter, right? That's how I look like, okay. Um, and there's another potential which I find really interesting because we always talk about, um, we, we talk about these buildings, but you know, you, you're, you're able to just have these portals everywhere that beam you somewhere else, right? So you can literally just build a lobby and then have different portals in different worlds that you can explore and while this, I hope this works now, let's see. Um, um, and then you end up in a totally different world. And I think in terms of um, creating spaces that are, that are engaging, that are new. This 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 also like bears some potential for us because um, you you can build something that looks like your office lobby, and then it has like portals and rooms into different worlds. Now we're like we ended up on Mars somehow, right? So you can explore Mars for your collaboration needs. I mean, this is totally random. Don't take me wrong. No one has to go to Mars, but you know what I mean. I think the uh, the only thing I wanted to show is that uh, you know you can start exploring all these different elements of it and um, I guess this is what we you know what we will continue doing and uh, uh, we realize that there's a lot of interest also from the client community um, particularly because everyone is asking themselves what hybrid world will look like and how can you solve the problem of not being able to have informal communication 
venues, you know, if you sit at home, um, if you work from home, everything is planned, everything is structured, and yeah, we hope we can contribute to that a little bit. Um, with that, thank you so much, and I will give my word to Giovanni again. Thank you, Marcus, um, for this really interesting insight into and um, this little journey into the virtual worlds that are now available to us and i think um and i think it's interesting no, that already uh, keep, keep your questions we, we're gonna we're gonna go around later but i think it's interesting that those different very different ways in which technology can change the way we work uh and and the type of work that we as architects do uh, and Chiara now is going to show a project that is very dear to my heart because it uh, has a lot to do with sustainability and the responsibility that we as architects have um, in creating a sustainable built environment um, and helping or not being damaging to the uh, environment <laughs> around us. Um, and, and it also has to do with making visible the invisible um, and um, particularly something that is very hard to grasp, the embodied carbon that is in our buildings. So thank you, Chiara. Thanks, Giovanni. Yeah, as Giovanni already introduced, um, we are trying to visualize the invisible. Um, two years ago, we started developing this tool um, that was born from this question, how, how heavy are our buildings? How, what, what is their impact and uh, how can we um, change it? So for the people who are maybe not from the built environment, I'm going to introduce to uh, a few statistics for exactly the built environment is responsible for uh, more than 30% of global energy consumption and uh, creates almost 40% of the global emissions. So um, already here we have a big uh, impact and uh, obviously also a big potential to reduce those numbers. At the same time, in Germany, uh, the raw material extraction is from the only the built environment is about 90%, and we create more than half of the waste. Um, so also here, uh, a lot of uh, potential. Um, so with this in mind, uh, we as architects and um, project uh, cooperators have a huge responsibility uh, in order to uh, reduce these numbers. Um, and since uh, we're in, in the realm of digitization and optimization and AI and the metaverse, we asked ourselves how technology can help us to uh, achieve this, and this goal in reducing the carbon emissions of our buildings. Um, and from that, we developed our tool, the Carbonitor, uh, which is a working title, but I think it uh, displays very well uh, what we want to show. We want to visualize the global warming potential or CO2 equivalent in our buildings. Um, and as you can imagine from this building already, the colors uh, play a role in this. So um, saddling on top of the BIM or building integrated modeling, which most of you will probably also uh, know or have heard, uh, where you put all of the information of a project into the software um, to reduce uh, mistakes in the end uh, and to, to see how the project um, would, would work, potentially put it into the metaverse to walk around now. Um, we decide, or we thought um, we our software or our tool um, should integrate seamlessly into this process that we are also working in at 10. Uh, and we've called it the carbon integrated modeling, which is only in uh, parentheses because it's not anything new, it's just a kind of an upgrade to what BIM already does. And this is especially important in the very early phases because that's where the potential for change in the project is highest. This is where the program is, um, is defined, which is what we do in design, stu uh, design strategy or the programming. So if we challenge the brief, that's even better, but um, maybe we can also uh, adapt the massing, uh, change the materiality or the structural concept of our project. And that's what uh, the Carbonitor is trying to visualize. So basically, the Carbonitor has three goals. First, on a very personal level, we want to create the awareness, how much carbon is stored in our buildings, what, uh, what consequences do our design decisions and ma material choices have. Um, but we also want to visualize the planning levers that we have, not only the absolute numbers, but also what, what can we do about it? Like, uh, how can we change it? How can we do better? Um, and in total, and that's the bull's eye, obviously we want to contribute to reducing the CO2 emissions of the uh, construction industry. 
So uh, let's dive into how the carbonator works. And for um, those of you who are a bit nerdy, uh, this is basically behind the scenes. Um, it's all based on the general BIM model that we have, and we feed it the input of an external database. That's, for example, the ECOBAUDAT, but it can also be any other database. For example, 2050 Materials is a new kind of database that, um, that has essentially the, the values that we need. And for now, we are translating this database to fit to our process. So at hand, we tweak it a bit um, to work with what the Carbonator does, which is two things mainly. It asks the project um, questions. So what are you? What are your elements? Which is what we generally already do in our pr process. So it's nothing we need to additionally do. Um, and it uh, develops limits from this database um, respectively for the building and for the building components. So the output that you get generate from the carbonator is on one level, on the macro view, for example, you can compare um, office buildings or science buildings. Um, and on the micro view, you can compare uh, the components. Um, so if you dive into or if you open the carbonator here at HEN, <laughs> This is what you will see. This is the dashboard, and essentially it gives you um, all of the most important information. Three of those. And the first is the macro view, as I just explained. It's the building typology, just to be sure to compare apples with apples. Um, because if you compare an office building, for example, with a science building, the, the, um, the parameters are completely different, and it wouldn't make so much sense. Then obviously you also see the embodied carbon um, of, uh, of the building. And as you can see here already, the uh, horizontal structure and the facade and the structural walls are especially intensive, and the micro view showing the individual elements um, with their gradient. Um, the individual elements have the same gradient, but it's important to uh, d um, divide them because um, it would be kind of unfair to compare a non-structural wall to a structural wall. As you can see here, uh, a non-structural wall should potentially have a much lower CO2 value than a structural wall, um, simply because of the, the things that it needs to be able to perform. And now we can dive into the tool. So you would enter this dashboard, click uh, into the, for example, the typology. You can change it here from office, for example, to science. It will change the leverages. It will sh um, show where your um, project uh, performs within those leverage for a uh, um, Sanierungsprojekt, obviously the, the CO2 two goal would be much lower than for an office project. Um, then here it gives you a live view of the embodied carbon uh, numbers in your project. Um, and then you can go into, into your tool um, as you would in under normal circumstances in, uh, in the 3D view of, uh, of your planning process. And um, you can cut it open a bit, sorry. Uh, could be a bit faster. Uh, you can cut it open and you can see, okay, the floors here, for example, are pretty red. Um, so that's where there's the most potential for change. Um, the value, and uh, here you can see this is uh, concrete now. So what if just for fun right now for this presentation, we would change to change it to wood. Um, what would that mean for our carbonator? So then it will run again. Um, load for a few seconds, hopefully. Uh, this is the running part. This is basically the calculation that it does uh, behind the scenes. And then you update the parameters, and then it becomes white, showing that there's basically not much more that you can do. This is a bit um, plakative now, I want to say, but um, essentially that's how the, the carbonator works. And it will also update every other um, number that you see here. So. Yeah, that's the tool um, in, a, in a very quick version, and obviously it's a, it's a lot of work to really go into the nitty-gritty and, um, and see what exactly you can change in the project. And now I've talked a lot about we and us. This is basically the HEN team that's been working on this project for about two years. Um, and to increase our impact, um, we want to open source um, this project and also seek collaborators uh, within the built environment. We're already uh, in collaboration with a few of those. Um, and obviously we're also having uh, thoughts about further developments. For example, we want to uh, roll out the carbonator for Rhino also, which is 
uh, software that we use in the very early stages of, uh, for example, competitions, where maybe you can like tweak the massing even more without having the concrete construction as you saw it now in the project, um, and that will give you a very early, um, um, very early uh, global warming potential for your building. We want to create the Carbonita 2.0 to uh, detach it a bit from the Revit interface and uh, create a website-based landing page that includes an LCA. This is something that the Carbonita in this moment isn't doing. It's not creating a report. Not, uh, LCA is a life cycle analysis. Um, it's just basically showing you or enabling the planner to improve um, the building. We want to integrate into the I2 software that we're using for our costs uh, to compare costs and uh, CO2. Um, obviously, also with the regulations and EU taxonomies, that's more and more important. And um, connected to what Fabi uh, told you earlier, we uh, are looking into creating the Carbonata 3.0, which will um, be able to interact by a natural language. So basically also an artificial intelligence that will allow you to actually chat to the model and um, you can ask it, okay, what's, what's the worst element that we built in this, pro in this project? Can you please show it to me? And what's the best model, um, the best material that we can exchange it for or what's the best way to exchange or to change this, um, this design? So if any of this interests you and if you want to um, ask questions or uh, connect, please uh, get in touch. I'd be happy to, um, to connect you to the little community that I've just shown you. And yeah, thank you. Maybe if I can start with a conversation starter, no? Very often there is, when you look in the media about uh, AI uh, and the metaverse, uh, AI is going to destroy the world. Uh, that, that has been, um, no? We've been discussing this uh, recently, no? That, that there are a lot of uh, articles from intellectuals that are asking for uh, a pause in the development of AI. Um, there is uh, a lot of talks, no? say uh, AI can, can really upend society. Um, some have called AI a bigger threat to humanity than global warming. Um, and I think on, on, on both the three presentations, there was a very pragmatic uh, and down-to-earth way of working um, with the tool that was shown. Um, and my question to start is like, uh, and, and you're showing how, how these things can change the way really our work is, no? um, our activities, but also uh, the scope of our work. Um, and my question is also, uh, what is the new responsibility that come as architects uh, when we're dealing with, uh, um, with those tools. How do we interact with our clients? How do we uh, participate in this development? We're, of course, mostly users. I mean, Chiara was showing some small actual development uh, that we're doing in terms of tools, but we're mostly users of existing technology. Also, the Carbonitor, we, we, we leverage a lot of uh, existing infrastructure. Um, how does this open up uh, our role uh, and, and pu puts us in front of new responsibilities um, and, and the new challenges? Whoever. I think Fabian ended his, his talk with, with something that's really important because we don't I think we started particularly with a very like um, close view on a very uh, small scope of what AI can do, you know, because um, a lot is about figuring out how it actually works and what it is and what it can do for you. And we got we got tempted quite a bit to, you know, jump in all kinds of different tools and think about, you know, uh, how can it change processes further down the road, but. Um, we looked very particularly only on, on, on these words and image ideas, the exploration and kind of consolidation of information, which is kind of at, at its core the part of our work in our department for that very reason, because you, 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 you get distracted. There's so many possibilities. There's so little understanding, in fact, on the, the, the potential of AI and what it will be down the road that I think our approach was to 
uh, start small, start to understand what it is, start to figure out how it works. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure that the next you know, year or two will, will, will significantly change how we, th we think about it. And I think our responsibility is like, um, you know, like it's the same. It's like s something similar than we have with the with the environment, right? You can do, you can continue doing things how you always would do to your to your own benefit, you know, uh, to your to your uh, uh, bottom line of your you know uh, uh, P and L statement, or you uh, b try to look from broader perspective and um, uh, try to figure out what what is also the, the 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 good thing to do, not only the thing that you might be able to do with it. But to be honest, we are not there yet. We didn't. We didn't like get anywhere close. These edges where you think all m all of a sudden you have a tool at hand that blows everything out of the water in front of you. You know, um, once we get there, I'm sure we can share that. But we didn't get anywhere close in the time we approached or we we got to test those tools. Um, I think this was also uh, we so like in the in the talk or in our research um, process we also threw up the question can it accelerate processes that we have or can it create a new process like with the information that is available and so far I also would agree we ha we haven't found something that is like truly beyond what we also as uh, as humans could do and uh, I think until now it was mainly speeding up the things that we already used and also in many cases. We, need, we needed to be very specific also about the inputs that we wanted. For example, with the sketches, we needed to input it already a finished sketch to get something that resembles the sketch. So I would also agree it's, but, uh, and also at the same time, I also think it's a, it's a learning by doing, only by, by using it, we, yeah, we can figure out how, how and where it actually is useful. Yeah. My microphone also doesn't work. Um, I would say in terms of sustainability and our carbon tools, very clearly two things, uh, honesty and accountability. So we need to be honest with us and our clients um, and maybe even the public um, with what our uh, carbon values are in our projects. And we need to hold ourselves accountable um, and change for the better. Thank you. Um, and I think that there is also another microphone that is going around, or maybe not, but this one can go around. So um, I'm also happy to open the conversation. Um, yeah, there is somebody all the way at the back. I'm coming. It's not somebody. Hi, Giovanni. Hey, um, I, this is, I guess, kind of a, a, a Fabian question. Um, I really like how simply you put it earlier that uh, design strategy works with words and images. Um, I'm interested to see what you think, kind of a little bit, maybe in like the medium to long term. Um, how does the audience for words and images change when there's this kind of saturation with AI-generated uh, text and graphic content that, you know, at, at this point, for example, you know, uh, 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 you can impress people with something that's created by, by mid-journey or something like that. What happens, when, what happens when that's no longer impressive? What happens when people are kind of jaded by that? How does that change how you use the tools and how do you stay ahead of something like that? That's a big question. <laughs> I don't know if we can find the answer to this in, in, in this space today. But um, yeah, I, I, I think okay. now I, I think it's um, what what is interesting for me is actually like this hybrid workflow. So how can we build up on something that AI made and maybe using one of the sketches I'm shown could be just a fragment of a Photoshop collage that still somebody of us is putting together or is drawing on, but it still would maybe create some kind of new style or new new elements. But I mean, in a broader sense, I, I guess only time time can show this where, where it's going to go. And um, yeah, I mean, also, I can already feel this now a little bit after how, how long has Mitchell been out half a year that you uh, kind of get to know like there's a certain st style of images that I also feel like okay I've seen this already so then the question now is like what comes next yeah and I guess it also is very linked to the tool itself I um, I think each tool also produces different results somehow because they all have kind of a different um, model in the background yeah 
doesn't work. But the basis of AI is not that it's limited to a certain element, right? And I don't think words and images will come out of fashion because then I don't know what, would, what, we, what we are left with. <laughs> no words anymore. And um, we talked in another, in another context about the jobs that, that arise. And I think um, the potential is obvious. You, you, you I think the potential of those tools is to create any image you can think of right now and anything you cannot think of right now. So it's all depending of um, you know, how you prompt it, how you ask it, how you use it um, in order to create uh, you know, the output that might bring you to the next level. I'm pretty sure that if you use a certain type of image uh, uh, over and over again, it's getting, you know, it's getting boring. It's the same with if you're reusing your ideas as an architecture office or uh, at some point it, 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 it you know it's it's not what 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 you should do anymore the same thing will happen there but it's a generative t generative tool right so uh, if you put in other elements and new elements then i think the output will be different and i think this is going to be a very interesting um yeah uh, element to follow or development to follow I think that there is also obviously a, no, a hype cycle. And yes, at the moment course, we are yeah. in a high point of after a long AI winter. But yeah, we'll see where, where, where it lands. Oh. Um, my name is Joanna. <laughs> and I have a question about the carbonator. Um, is this carbonator needs a lot of data? Is it realistic that you can use it for every project um, to really, well, better the things there? Or is it actually like a lot more uh, workload that you have to do that is not even possible for the projects normal architecture bur offices are doing? I hope this does it work. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, sorry, yes. Uh, it needs a lot of data, but uh, we've optimized uh, the carbonator to use the data that uh, that is in the in the behind the scenes, so, uh, so to speak. And everything else works similar to how we would usually w work and build our model in in a process um, of um, building a project. We would give it uh, assign it materials. We would give it depths and heights and everything else and the carbonator just puts another another layer on top of it and it asks it okay what are you and uh, and how good or bad are you yeah. maybe if i can add uh, one word on that because i'm also involved in the development of the tool uh, essentially the, the, the tool is designed to to be as little effort as possible so it, it piggybacks on our on simple naming conventions so you need to name things anyway in Revit, uh, so you don't have to go through extra parameters, um, and it's also done in a way that uh, it, it it doesn't uh, expose the end user, the average architect, to 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 have to directly access the, all the complex database, EPD, making sense of all of that. We have created a filter that happens in the in the middle, where few people can help manage this infrastructure for the whole. Uh, office, so reducing really the, the amount of effort uh, and expertise that, that is uh, needed. And we are essentially very close to be able to run this automatically on every project every night. So that's kind of the, the, the goal, so that you know and part of your splash screen we already have as part of the design system, kind of when you open a Rhino file, you have a, 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 mo uh, sorry, a Revit file, you have your uh, model uh, well-being analytics, no? if your model is too big, if there are a lot of conflicts, if Revit is complaining about the way you've modeled uh, things, uh, and this is going to be something like that and as standard um, as this. Um, and we're also working toward open sourcing this so that it's not just our thing, but it's out there for the community and for other people, smarter, uh, than us to, to check it and to tell us wh whatever might be wrong with it and how to make it better. There is also a microphone at the back. If El Elena is holding it up. Everyone is waiting for a drink. Everybody's waiting. Probably. <laughs> oh, there was one, I think. 
Just a very brief question about the carbonator, if it would be uh, thinkable or maybe it's already in your minds to widen it to other parts of the ecological footprint. Uh, temperature in cities and wind flow or biodiversity, uh, water, precipitation, things like that. Um, yeah, if you already have that in your minds. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, we're going to build up a whole ecosystem that will take into consideration all of the, um, the, the elements that you just stated. But for now, it was, uh, and, and we're already also using, I probably Giovanni is better to answer that question and more on a like, strategic view. Um, but um, we're, already, we're already implementing these uh, certain calculations. They're just not under the umbrella of the carb carbonator, which you just presented now, the carbonators around embodied carbon. And uh, then Giovanni's team of sustainability has a lot of many other tools that may or may not be called carbonator in future. <laughs> I don't think that there is one app to rule them all, uh, and uh, and some of those and there are different levels of um, specialization um, and different level of urgency as well to some of those questions. And I think the the carbonator is also not the the only app that serves the life cycle of a project that serves a certain phase. Um, in the very early phases, we we are looking at how do we do more even simpler, but robust assessment, and then in later phases we have our uh, QS process that can support uh, with all of this, and similarly we already do a lot of um, environmental analysis to, to understand operational energy, but to understand um, also heat island effect and microclimate and and so on. Um, and I don't think that necessarily everything has to come under one app. Uh, and not, not also not, not, not necessarily everything has to be one click just yet, hopefully soon. Uh, but this one, we, we thought this, th there is a real urgency uh, with, with this thing. And when, when we look at the statistics that Chiara was showing, uh, especially, uh, the, 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 the biggest leverage that we have as architects is, is the material that, that our buildings is made. No? Uh, the operational energy, it's kind of during the lifetime of the building. Um, there is a, a general trend toward decarbonizing, decarbonizing the grid, so um, it's, um, it's, it's a problem that operates over a longer lifespan that concerns more the existing building the, the, rather than the new build, but as architects we have this great impact that happens in one, two years during the construction phase of a building, and we really need to tackle that. Mariana, you had a question. Uh, it's also uh, for the Carbonator project. Um, yeah, since we are talking about this now, I was just thinking because Chiara also showed earlier the example where, for example, you have your Revit model and obviously you already designed all the structure in a way that it works with a certain material and then it's red and then you want to tweak it to make it white but then of course then you have to adapt the sizing of the elements or maybe um, even the massing somehow changes either of individual elements or of parts of the building. And how, what is the thinking behind this? Like, is this more at the moment being used as a tool where you already have the design and then you kind of raise awareness about what it looks like, but then you continue with the status quo for the later no. phases? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then you're like, oops, too bad, we, we made it like that, but now we can't recalculate all the sizes of all the slabs to change the material, for example, for all of them. No, so it's more about the process. Obviously, the two things are, I think now you can hear me, the two things are connected. Um, Oh. Yeah, it's you. It's <laughs> me. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Obviously, the two things are connected. And the first goal, as I showed uh, on the dark uh, side earlier, is to create an environment for the planner. The, the conventional design decisions that you make, what's, what's the consequences that they have in the project. And then obviously it's still the question of a designer or a creator to adapt these materialities and adapt the, the depths and the, the design to, to then uh, create a new, um, a new outlet for a CO2 equivalent. Probably something that uh, Fabi would also assign that in the end the creative part will not ever be taken away from a tool or from AI, um, but rather from the people who then uh, steer it into a direction that works for a project or a creative, for any creative process. 
question before we end. Yes, I would, I would end with a wish. My name is Vika Akis. And um, I, what my wish would be is that we as architects, we try to add some beauty to it. Because I don't know how you feel about this, but when I see those uh, worlds in metaverse, as I always have the feeling that you know all these ugly plants standing around, the stiff people moving in a strange way, and I have the feeling that um, we should still keep the aesthetics and rules of design in mind when we try to interact with those tools. And maybe this is our role as well, because when you look in an art world. Uh, for example, um, for example, what Johann König did here in, um, uh, in his gallery, then you can see that they are already trying to adapt more, um, more beauty, more, more, I don't know, haptic to to surfaces. And I think this should be something we drive as well in this discussion. Can we cross them? Can we run this? <laughs> I, I can only agree, um, but it would be so interesting what 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 our contribution to beauty, to haptics, to materials, to spatial experiences can be in a, in this kind of abstract digital world. And I find that one of the biggest biggest questions because a lot of the things are, you know, if you look at at, at, at artists that work with AI, um, there's a lot of beautiful things out there, but a lot of that. Is neither spatial nor um, uh, yeah ha has any any it you know if you go into a space like the Königs Gallery you know it does something to you right there's a there's a feeling of space and you immediately feel that it feels different than when you walk into a uh, into your kitchen pantry you know and uh, the equivalent to that in a digital space. Uh, I don't know what that is. I have literally no idea until this point. And I think this is what we need to figure out, or maybe we don't need to, but I think this is what the interesting questions would be. What, what is this contribution to the spatial experience in a digital world if you don't have this very basic element like smell and feel and haptics and uh, cold and warm and you know that drives our architectural understanding so far. Yeah. I think I would just add that beauty is also obviously in the eye of the beholder and the metaverse can open a bandwidth of beauties and maybe the new kind of groups or communities that are interested in one type of beautiful aesthetics in one way so ever and then would find themselves in that metaverse so yeah, it, it kind of redefines beauty maybe even or um, making it more you know, fluid or diverse yeah. Okay, um, so I, I would like to thank Fabian, Chiara, and Marcus for the presentations and the talks, and all of you for the participation and for the interesting conversation, which doesn't stop here, can continue. There are a few drinks uh, at the back, and you're welcome to stay here and mingle and ask all the other questions and have more conversation uh, this evening. Thank you.